Hello. Firstly, let me give my thanks to the Korea Herald for inviting me to address the Eco Forum. As the UK's COP26 envoy, I am delighted that this forum is shining a light on the climate emergency and the need for urgent action at the local, national and global level. These were the themes which were discussed during the recent P4G summit, which I am grateful President Moon hosted. Alongside COVID, climate change is perhaps the clearest example we have of a genuinely transnational issue, one which will affect all nations and all peoples indiscriminately. And that is why all roads this year lead to COP26, which will be held in the UK in Glasgow this November. COP26 will be the most important international climate conference since the Paris Agreement in 2015, where world leaders came together to commit to limit global temperature rise to well below 2 degrees centigrade and as close to 1.5 degrees centigrade as possible. That 1.5 degree C target is critical. Indeed, every fraction of a degree makes a difference. The science shows us clearly that a temperature rise of 2 degrees rather than 1.5 degrees would mean hundreds of millions more people being affected by climate change. The decade 2020 to 2030 is the decisive decade to deliver on the Paris Agreement and COP26 must serve as a global moment for climate action, one where the international community turns words and promises into action. The UK as president of COP26 is pressing for action around four key goals to deliver on the Paris Agreement. The goals of mitigation, adaptation, finance and collaboration. Our first goal, mitigation, means driving down emissions to ensure that the world is on a path to net zero. The science is clear. If we want to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, the world needs to reach net zero emissions around the year 2050, and we need to halve global emissions by 2030. We have already made a lot of progress towards this goal. This year we will see the first ever net zero G7 summit, with all countries responsible for about 55% of the global economy committed to reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2050 at the latest, and making deep emissions, uh, in our, uh, deep emissions reductions in the 2020s. We've also seen ambitious 2030 emissions reduction targets by nationally determined contributions or NDCs from developing and developed countries alike, including the European Union, the US, Jamaica, the UK, Japan and Colombia, amongst many others. And so I congratulate President Moon's leadership <coughs> in announcing last year that Korea would set its own 2050 net zero target, and I welcome his commitment to announce a revised NDC COP before COP26 and we very much hope that that will be consistent with a 1.5 degree C trajectory and Korea's own path towards net zero. However, despite this progress, we need to see significantly more global ambition. Our best calculations indicate that as things stand and based on current policies, the world is heading towards around 2.5 to 3 degrees centigrade of warming by 2100. This will be disastrous for our children and for our grandchildren. And so we need more countries to come forward with long-term commitments to net zero by mid-century. And we need to see more ambitious 2030 emissions reduction targets. And we need to see action in vital areas like power generation, clean transport and halting deforestation. Now I'm very conscious the UK is far from perfect, but over the last 30 years we have demonstrated what is achievable in a relatively short time frame. Since 1990 we've grown our economy by 78%, the second fastest in the G7 club of industrialised nations, whilst cutting our emissions by 45%. The last decade from 2010 to 2020 was one in which the UK achieved a rapid decarbonisation of our energy sector reducing coal usage from about 40% of our electricity in 2012 to just 2% in the last 12 months. And we will end electricity generation from coal power completely by 2024. In the same way, we need the world's biggest coal users, including Korea, to make similar strides over the next decade 
and to phase out coal use. Our second goal is adaptation, because reducing emissions won't by itself be enough, because the climate is already changing and the climate will continue to change even as emissions fall. And so our second goal is to protect people and nature amidst climate change. We have already seen in excess of one degree centigrade of anthropogenic warning, warming since pre-industrial times. And this warming is linked to extreme weather events, which will be more and more frequent, more extreme and more damaging as climate change continues. So the floods we saw last summer in Korea when the River Han burst its banks, the ever more frequent bouts of extreme weather, including typhoons which hit Busan, and the crop failures which in recent years have blighted Korea's agricultural regions are all portents of what the future holds. So we're encouraging all countries to put in place urgent measures to protect and help our communities and natural habitats to adapt to the destructive effects of climate change. To support this, we want to accelerate progress towards a global goal for adaptation. We want to strengthen actions such as early warning systems and resilient infrastructure to avoid loss of lives and livelihoods. And we want to scale up public and private adaptation finance. Which leads me to our third goal, mobilizing finance to tackle climate change. In Glasgow, we need to demonstrate that progress towards making finance flows uh, consistent with a net zero pathway and climate resilient development is underway. And we can demonstrate that by accelerating the use of public finance to unleash the trillions in private finance that are needed to deliver on our climate goals. We can show this by helping developed countries make good on their commitment to provide $100 billion per year of climate finance to developing economies. And we can do this by ensuring that every financial decision taken, be it by governments or banks or investors, takes climate change into account. We're working with international financial institutions to ensure that countries' recovery plans from COVID are aligned with the Paris Agreement. And we are already seeing other major world economies embrace this approach. For instance, in Korea, the Korean Financial Services Commission and the Financial Supervisory Service and many of Korea's companies are beginning to manage their climate risks in line with the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. And we'd encourage other countries to follow the UK's lead in making this compulsory for listed firms from 2023 onwards. All of this progress is only possible through our fourth goal of collaboration, encouraging countries and industry and the financial sector and academia to work together to limit the worst extremes of climate change. We need to build a consensus amongst governments to ensure that we can finalise the remaining elements of the Paris rulebook as part of a successful negotiated outcome in Glasgow. Now, South Korea is an outstanding example of a country where sub-national action has prompted national ambition and where collaboration has been critical. In 2018, Chungnam province became the first East Asian member of the Powering Pass Coal Alliance, a coalition determined to bring an early end to coal use. And since Chunnam's first step, uh, three more cities, Seoul, Incheon and Daegu, and three provinces, Kyungyi, Jeju and Gangwon, have all become members of the PPCA, encouraging the national government to take more ambitious action. Businesses also have a key role to play, and it's great to see that the Xinhan Financial Group and KB Financial Group have signed up to be founder members of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, illustrating that Korea's two biggest banking groups see Paris-aligned investment as critical to their future business models. As we approach COP26, we can learn much from the lessons of COVID. Both are fundamentally global problems where the cost of inaction is far greater than the cost of action. COVID has demonstrated the importance of following science and of international collaboration, and it's shown us that prevention is less costly than cure. Changes to our economies can and will happen much faster than many of us expect. We've seen this with COVID. And many of the solutions and technology to, to the climate change problem already exist. And if we can decarbonize our economies and enable a green recovery from COVID using existing technologies, the cost of clean energy has, in just a decade,
become cheaper than the cost of fossil fuels in most parts of the world. And the International Energy Agency now calls solar power the cheapest form of electricity the world has ever known. And year on year, the cost of zero emission vehicles falls and the global fleet of zero emission vehicles broadly doubles. Consumers, investors, businessmen and now governments are forming up behind the proposition that significant decarbonisation should take place in the next decade and can take place in the next decade. And so I'm confident that the international community can come together at COP26 to set the world on a new path. Thank you.